Church families, you would take a seat and open your Bibles up to Ephesians chapter 3. We started back in January walking through this short letter uh, that Paul writes. And we started in chapter 1 by really seeing that Paul begins this book by praising God for what we have been given in Jesus Christ. And what Paul says is that in Jesus we have been given salvation and redemption and forgiveness. That God has literally given us a place in his plans and in his promise. And along with that, Paul says that he has given us a guarantee and an inheritance. And in the back half of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul began to pray in week 2 for this church. And what he really prayed for them is that they would know more of God and they would know more of his blessings. And Paul specifically prayed that they would know more of the hope that God has given us in Christ. That they would know more of the way that God sees us because of Christ. And that they would know more of the power that is available to us because of Jesus. In week three, we explored that power a little bit more, the, the power of God's grace in our lives, that even when we were dead and even when we were disobedient and even when we were decadent and even we, when we were doomed in our sin, that God literally picked us up out of those things and that he gave us life and he gave us victory and he gave us authority in Jesus. And then two weeks ago, Truman took us through the back half of Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul begins to talk about this idea that as a result of believing the gospel, that we have literally been brought together and given a new identity, an identity that literally overcomes every boundary and every difference and every wall that we seek to erect in our world and in our culture today. And then last Sunday, if you're here or if you're joining us online, we actually stepped out of Ephesians and into the book of Romans. And we really looked at the idea that this gospel we've been talking about was always meant for all nations. That it was sufficient for all nations. And it's because of that, and because Paul understood that, he says, look, he says, I have a, a purpose, and I have a passion, and I have a plan that my entire life, my entire existence is shaped by the fact that I know that this gospel has to get to everyone who has not heard it. And so this week, I want us to step back into Ephesians, into really a passage that is also all about mission. And my hope is that we walk out of here today really seeing five things, five things that Paul teaches us that the grace of God does to help bring us into the very mission of God. So look at Ephesians chapter 3. We are going to read verses 1 through 13 together. This is what scripture says. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning, and God, I thank you for your word. But Lord, even more than this word, I thank you for your gospel. And Lord, that we are gathered here because you sent your son to die for us. And so Lord, this morning in this place, I pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to everything that you desire to say. God, I pray that you might edit into the sermon what you desire to be said, and that you might edit out anything you don't want to be said. And Lord, that in this moment... Every part of me would decrease and every part of you would increase and that you would receive all the glory and all the honor. Lord, we love you so much. 
Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I want us to begin by looking that Paul starts this out. And, and before we even jump in, you got to know that Paul really gets distracted here. And I spent about half this week in study trying to figure out if I could say that about Scripture. Like, can you say that an author of Scripture got distracted? Well, he, he does. Which is why this passage seems a little disjointed. Paul is beginning, we think, because he wants to pray for this church again. And yet he does what so many pastors do. He just gets distracted and starts rolling. But within that, he really kind of ends up revealing to us really the first thing that God does to bring us into his mission. Look at verse 1. Because what Paul says is that our mission defines our reality. He starts in verse 1. He says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles... Now, look, we need to understand that Paul is not using a metaphor here at all. He is literally in prison when this letter is written. And the reason that he was in prison is because of his ministry to the church at Ephesus. Acts 21 tells us a story. In Acts 21, Paul brings an offering from all of the churches of Asia Minor and Macedonia back to Jerusalem for the benefit of of Jewish believers who are struggling. Actually, one tells us that that offering seems to be pretty well received. But it also tells us that along the way, Paul traveled to Jerusalem with two Asian believers, two believers from the church at Ephesus, one of whom's name was Trophimus. Now, Paul, during this journey, had apparently taken what's called a Nazarite pledge. Uh, and basically, that was just a pledge that, hey, God, I'm going to purify myself for a very specific purpose. And so at the end of that pledge, the law was that you had to shave your head and then go make a special sacrifice at the temple. So Acts 21 tells us that Paul, because his head had been shaved, goes to the temple to make the sacrifice. And in the temple, Jews from Ephesus see Paul. And they begin to stir up a crowd saying, this man has brought Gentiles into the temple. And this is the same man that is teaching everywhere that you don't have to be a Jew to be saved. They stir up such a, a mob that Paul literally begins to be beaten and stoned in the midst of the temple. Roman guards have to intercede on his behalf. They draw him out. And that begins a long process of imprisonment for Paul. He's in jail in Jerusalem. He's then moved to Caesarea where he's in jail for two years. He appeals to Caesar and he is moved again to Rome where he writes this letter. And so what Paul says to them is he reminds them that he is where he is quite literally because of this church, because of the mission that God had given him, had taken him to Ephesus, and the people had believed in Jesus. He's where he is because of them. And yet, I want you to skip down to the end of the passage. Look at what he says in verse 13 at the very end. He says this. He says, So I ask you not to lose heart, over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul's in prison. He's in prison for the sake of these believers that he's writing to. And he says, look, I want you to know that I am where I am because of you. But yet, don't you lose heart because everything that I am going through, it's for your glory. And I wonder how many of us would let our mission shape our reality in that way. How many of us would be okay with enduring prison and enduring persecution and enduring put-downs for the sake of the gospel going out to other people? I found this quote this week from William Tyndale, a man who was literally burned at the stake for the crime of translating the Bible into the language that we hold right now. And he said this, he said, for if God be on our side, what matter maketh it who be against us? Be they bishops, cardinals, popes, or whatsoever names they will. For Tyndall, the mission of getting the gospel, of getting God's word into the hands of the everyday person of England, to him it was worth whatever they could do to him. It literally shaped his reality the same way that Paul's mission defined his reality. And I love that Paul doesn't identify himself as a prisoner of Jesus for the Gentiles in order that they would feel bad for him. 
He doesn't ask them, if you notice, or request that they try to intercede for them. He doesn't ask them to help him. Instead, he says, look, this is who I am, and this is where I am, and it's okay. He says it's okay. More than okay, he says that everything I'm going through, he says, is for you. It's for your glory. It's for your honor. It's for your dignity. It's for your blessing. Paul's mission defined his reality. And it didn't matter what his circumstances was because his mission told him how to look at them. Which means that Paul's mission also determined his perspective. Look at verses 2 and 3. Paul says this. He says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Now look, Paul uses three different words here to describe the ministry that he has. First, he uses the word stewardship, which literally was a, a household word. It, it described the act of managing a household, of putting everything in order so that a house could run the way it was supposed to run. In English, we translate this word as dispensation. So that what Paul is literally saying here is that God has given him a dispensation of grace. And what he means by that is that God has systematically revealed to him how grace was to be managed in the household of faith. Now you may say, Joe, why is that such a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because up to this point, up to the point that not only has Jesus come and that Paul has taken the word to the Gentiles, that the only path to salvation was through the Jewish faith. It, it's odd because the Jews really had no problem with Gentiles coming to faith in, in Jesus. Jews in general didn't have any problem with Gentiles worshiping Yahweh, but there was one important caveat. They didn't mind it as long as the Gentiles became Jewish first. As long as the Gentile was willing to submit themselves to circumcision, as long as they were willing to submit themselves to the law, as long as they were willing to do everything that a Jew would do, then it was fine for a Gentile to believe. But all of a sudden, Paul comes along and says, look, God has given me a new stewardship of grace. And how we've managed grace before in the past, all of a sudden we're going to manage it in a wholly different way. But Paul also describes his ministry as a gift. He says that the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. He says, look, this responsibility, I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it. He says, God has given it to me. And do you notice he says that he hasn't given it to me for my own sake, but he says he's given it to me for your sake. He says he gave it to me for you. And I wonder how many of us look at the ministry and the mission that God has given us. How many of us tend to look at God saving us and God calling us to follow him and to serve him and we really just see it for our benefit. How am I going to grow? How am I going to be able to manage everything? How can I do this on top of all my other schedules, all my other classes, all my other homework, all my other job responsibilities, all of our other family stuff? Because in our, our minds, subconsciously, we believe that God's grace has been given to us for us. But Paul says, look, it wasn't given to me for me. This grace and this ministry was given to me, he says, for you. And then finally, he describes this ministry as a mystery. He says, how the mystery was made known to me, he says, by revelation. And this word for mystery that Paul uses is a word that would have been very common to the believers in Ephesus. Ephesus was dominated by a numerous amount of cults in and around the city. You had the temple of Diana that dominated the view of the city up on the hill. And inside of those cults, there was what they called the mysterion. Or it was literally the truce that could only be revealed to those who had been initiated into the cult. You couldn't know them unless you were inside of that group. And Paul uses this word. And what he claims is that this mystery, this thing that you're only supposed to be able to know if you're inside that has been revealed to him is that he hopes that anyone who reads this letter will understand it. Look at what he says in verses 4 and 5. He says that when you read this, 
you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. And I love this because that word for insight literally meant to take all the different things around you and to form them into a holistic understanding. So what Paul is saying is that when you read this, my hope is that you can take everything you've seen, everything you've been taught, everything you've learned, everything that is around you, and you can put it together to understand the whole of God's grace. That you can understand the whole of the mystery that up to this point, he says, has only been revealed to those on the inside. But what Paul says is now that's all changed. Now, he says... That's, that's different. And so I think the question we have to ask is what is the mystery that Paul is talking about? What has Paul seen? What has he come to understand that he says, I want all of you to understand? Well, look at verses 6 and 7. Paul says this. He says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Now, Paul describes the Gentiles with three different terms, and he uses the same prefix for every term. And the prefix meant together with. It's really difficult in English for us to get the textual force that that would have carried for the Greeks when they read it. I think the NIV may do the best justice to it. And this is the way the NIV renders it. It says this. It says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Paul says, look, this is the mystery. This is the thing for which Paul was willing to give up his freedom and his life. This is the mystery. This is the truth that caused the Jews to mob him and to riot in the temple. And you have to understand how radical it is what Paul is saying here. When he says that the Gentiles are heirs together, he uses the same word that he uses in Romans 8.17 when he says this, describing all that we receive in the gift of salvation. He says, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is what Paul says the Gentiles share together with the Jews. He says, look, there's no inner circle with God and there's no outer circle. There are no first tier Christians and there are no second tier Christians. The Jews weren't the major ones and the Gentiles weren't like the secondary ones. He says, literally, all who are in Christ inherit all of the blessing of Christ, all of the love of Christ. And not only, Paul says, do they inherit it equally. This was the truly radical part. He says they inherit it jointly. And then he gives, I think, two pictures of what he means by that. First is this. He says that they are members together of one body. And I love that picture. You know why? Because your body can't receive a nutrient that doesn't benefit your whole body. You, you also can't take in anything that hurts just one part of your body and it doesn't affect the rest of your body. It's why Paul uses the body in 1 Corinthians 12 to describe the church. And he says that if one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts, right? If one part of the body rejoices, the whole body feels it. Paul is saying, look, you can't section it out. If you are part of the same body together, then you experience whatever the rest of the body experiences, both good and bad, right? And Paul's point to this church is, look, you're not an add-on to the Jews because that's what they felt like. He says, you're not, you're not just another part. He says, you are always meant to be and you are together with them. He says, just like they can't inherit the promise without you beside them, he says, they can't be whole without you beside them. You are members together of the same body. But then he also says that they are sharers together of the same promise. And this is important 
Because while the Bible speaks of many promises for those who believe, Paul uses the singular here. And he uses a singular with the definite article, which means that he's talking about the one promise. The one promise that every single person who has accepted Christ as their Savior shares. And it's the promise of salvation and redemption. And Galatians chapter 3, he puts it this way in verse 22. He says, But the Scriptures pronounce all things confined by sin, so that by faith in Jesus Christ, the promise might be given to those who believe. If you skip down in verses 26 to 29 of Galatians 3, Paul goes on. He says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Do you notice that? There's no racial boundary, Paul says anymore. There's no cultural boundary. There's no economic boundary. He says, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, he says, according to the promise. I love how the great preacher D. Martin Lloyd-Jones puts this. He says this. He says, we are all equally sinners. We are all equally helpless. We have all come to the one and the same Savior, and we have the same salvation. He says, we have the same Holy Spirit, the same Father. We even have the same trials, and we are all marching and going together, he says, to the same eternal home. Here's what Paul is getting at. Is not only does our mission define our reality, not only does our mission determine our perspective, but church, hear me on this, our mission destroys our prejudice. It doesn't just make it okay. It doesn't just gloss it over. It destroys it. It literally breaks down every boundary that our culture naturally builds up. Because in the midst of that, God is bringing us together that we might inherit his promise together, that we might enjoy it together, that we might benefit together from it. God says we are bringing it together. But our mission also dominates our experience. Look at verses 8 and 9. Paul says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? Do you notice that Paul says that he's the very least of all the saints? Now look, this is not false modesty. This is legitimately how Paul viewed himself. When Paul looked at who he was, when he looked at his past, he was floored that God could save him. When Paul looked at who he had been, he is continually in the New Testament amazed that not only would God save him, but that God would use him. I know this because he writes it multiple times. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, he says this. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, listen to this, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that comes from Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul says it this way. It starts in verse 13. He says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion? He says, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. He goes on in verse 15 and says, but... Even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9, Paul says it this way. For I am the least of all the apostles. He says, in fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. What this tells me is that for Paul, the mission that he had been given, the mission that you and I have been given, it overcomes our weaknesses and our failures. It overcomes our past. It overcomes our present. It overcomes our future. It literally 
dominates every moment of our experience, regardless of how you feel about it. You don't feel qualified enough? That's okay. You don't have to. You don't feel strong enough? That's okay. You're not. You don't feel smart enough? That's okay. You won't ever be. You don't feel holy enough? Well, join the club. Paul says, look, it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what I've walked through. This mission, it's more powerful than anything I have experienced or anything I will experience. But he also says that not only does it overcome his experience, it overwhelms his knowledge. He says, look, this grace was given to me, he says, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to life for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. When Paul uses that word for unsearchable riches, I love it because he has made up a word that you cannot find anywhere outside of the biblical Greek. Now, some people may hear that and be like, what do you mean Paul was making up words? It doesn't mean that Paul was legitimately just making up gibberish and giving it a definition. What it means is that Paul was taking two words that were already used in the Greek language and he was putting them together in a way that they had never been used together before. That's what it means. And so when Paul talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ, he uses two words that when you put them together, gives this picture of a road or a path that cannot be traced and it can't be fully followed. In other words, imagine going into a, a forest in which the deeper you get into it, the more you lose sight of where you came from and the more that you're not entirely sure where you're going. He uses the same word only one other time at the end of Romans chapter 11 when he has talked about the miracle of God grafting in the Gentiles into his family. And at the end of Romans chapter 11, in verse 33, he exclaims out almost in worship and praise these words. He says, Oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and how unscrutable are his ways. Here's what Paul is telling us. Paul is telling us that the riches of God, the value of knowing him and following him and serving him are like a trail that gets lost in the infinite depths of his love and his sovereignty. The more we explore it, the deeper we dive into it, the more we lose sight of where we came from and the more we lose sight of everything else. That, to Paul, was the riches of knowing God's grace. And what he says is, look, not only does this gospel, not only does this mission overwhelm my experience, right, what I know and what I've done, he says it overwhelms my knowledge. I can't even imagine what God has in it. And then he goes on because he says not only does it overwhelm human knowledge, he says it overwhelms divine knowledge. Look at verse 10, because it's a weird verse to just see if you don't understand what Paul is trying to say. Look at what he says. He says, all of this is so that through the church, the manifold or multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In other words, Paul says, all this is so that through the church, even the angels, even the inhabitants of heaven would be able to understand the mystery of God. Do you understand what Paul's saying? Paul is saying is that through you and through me, through us, that God is teaching even the angels what his grace means. That it's so unsearchable that not even the angels can grasp it and somehow there is something so powerful about the church, something so amazing about God pulling together a group of people from every race and every culture and every background that the angels look at it and they see a part of God that they have never been able to understand outside of it. If you want to understand why we tell you that Sunday mornings are not enough, church family, I don't know if I can give you a better description. There is no church service. There is no sermon in this world that can do that. Paul says the only thing that can do it is you. It's the church. That's why just showing up here, it's not what God intends for you. What God intends for you is for you to be a part 
of something so powerful that it overwhelms human knowledge and it overwhelms divine knowledge. The mission that God gave to Paul, the same mission that God has given to us, doesn't just dominate every moment of our experience, but it dominates every truth of our experience. Finally, this mission that God gave Paul, it draws us near to God. Look at verses 11 and 12. Paul writes, he says that this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. I love this. Now look, I'm an extrovert, so it's not going to be a surprise to you that I love this, because this word for boldness meant a freedom to speak. And the word for access literally implied a face-to-face -face interaction. So what Paul says is that, look, all of this was according to the purpose that what God wanted for you and what God wanted for me was that we might be able to confidently speak face-to-face -face with our Creator. What a picture that is. That we don't have to wonder if we're good enough or holy enough or old enough or strong enough or talented enough or smart enough or beautiful enough. That the only requirement, Paul says, for us to draw near to God is faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Church family, if that isn't good news, then I don't know what is. If that isn't good news that gives us hope, then I don't know what is. Because if, what it means is this, is if you have called out, if you have asked Jesus to be your Savior, if you believe that He is who He says He is, that He's the Son of God, if you believe that He gave His life on that cross to forgive us of our sins, and if you have called out to Him and said, Jesus, I need you to be my Lord and to be my Savior then you don't ever have to wonder what God will think about you. You don't ever have to wonder if he'll let you into heaven. You don't ever have to wonder if your life has been good enough to meet the bar because it has been met for you. That's the good news of the gospel. So let me ask you this morning as we close, do you know that? In fact, I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads right where you are. And if you're here this morning and you have never had a moment that you have called out for the grace of God, a moment where you have said, Jesus, I, I know that I've said things that weren't right. I know that I've done things that weren't right. I know that I've thought things that weren't right. And I believe that you were the son of God and that I cannot make myself right with a holy God without you. Jesus, I need you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. And I need you to forgive me and I need you to be my Savior and my Lord. If you have never had that moment, then I'll invite you just to pray a very simple prayer like this this morning. God, I don't want to question anymore if you'll let me into heaven. God, I don't want to wonder if I've lived good enough or if I've done enough good things to balance out the bad things in my life. God, I don't want to have the question of my eternity hanging over my head any longer. God, I want to know and I want to have the same confidence and boldness and access that Paul talks about. And so Jesus, please forgive me today. Please give me a new heart, give me a new spirit and do in my life what I can't do. God, that I would never again question where I stand with you. Now, church family, look back at me because for all of us who have cried out, all of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior, I think the question for us this morning is this. If Paul is right and if our mission is the same mission that he had and if our mission is supposed to define our reality and it's supposed to determine our perspective and it's supposed to destroy our prejudices and it's supposed to absolutely just dominate our experience, then can I ask you, why don't we do it more? Why, why do so few of us serve? Why do so few of us share our faith? Why do so few of us go onto the mission field? Look, I share with the first service, I 
love that you show up for Faith in Action Sundays. Like, I love it. And I love watching you serve in our community. But it's not enough. And it's not a replacement for our call to take the gospel to all the nations. I found this quote by Charles Spurgeon, and I'm going to apologize to you like I apologized to the first service because it hurt me this week. So if it hurts you this morning, I want you to know, blame Charles Spurgeon, not me. All right. This is what he said. He said, every Christian here is either a missionary or an imposter. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. You know what this makes me think about? It makes me think about the silly truck commercials you see on all the time. Because what do you do when you get a new, a new car or a new truck? You talk about it, right? And so you see all these commercials with those just silly, like GMC, Chevy, like multi-flex tailgate commercials. And it's just a tailgate, man. Like there's nothing special about it, right? But like this dude just can't stop talking about this tailgate. Because that's what we do. When we get a new pet, what do we do? We take pictures of it, man. We post it to Instagram and Facebook. When we go on vacation, we let everybody know where we're on vacation, right? Man, toes in the sand, mountains behind us. When we get new clothes, we take pictures. Some of us do. If you're Truman, maybe you do. I don't know. But you take a picture, right? You let people see how fresh you're looking. When we're excited about something, when we have a high appreciation, as Spurgeon says, it cannot be that our tongue will be silent about it. So many of us are silent about the gospel. So the question is why? 